Hello again. Um, I understand that Mr. Bill Bray will be substituting for Dr. Brown for the second panel, uh, and he will be here momentarily, uh, but uh, I will now introduce our second panel. Uh, Dr. Clarence Newsom is the president of Shaw University in Raleigh, a well-regarded uh, institution, I think, literally across the street from my district. Uh, Dr. Gary Bass is the founder and the executive director uh, at OMB Watch, not OMB, as my notes say. Um, I, I do know the difference. Um, OMB Watch has been very helpful to, uh, to me, to my staff, to the subcommittee uh, in the last two years. Uh, Dr. Jell Jerry Ellig is the senior research fellow. At fellow. Uh, feller is actually the North Carolina pronunciation. At the Merc Mercatus Center at, the, at George Mason University, uh, Ms. Danielle Bryan is the executive director of POGO, uh, the project on government accountability. Uh, and uh, Mr. Eric Gillespie is the senior vice president of products, technology, and innovation, and the chief information officer of Onvia, Onvia Incorporated, which has created the private stimulus watch website, recovery.org. Uh, as you know from having been here before, uh, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record. Uh, when you have completed your spoken testimony, your oral testimony, we will begin with questions and each member will have five minutes uh, to question the panel. It is the practice of the subcommittee to take uh, testimony under oath. Do any of you have any objection to taking an oath? No, uh, all, all witnesses appeared to nod that they had no objection. Uh, if not, you, have, uh, you, uh, you also have the right uh, to be represented by counsel. Uh, do any of you have counsel here? And the, all the witnesses uh, nodded that they did not. Uh, as I said before, we ask you these questions to put you at ease. Um, please stand now and raise your right hand. The... Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, each of the witnesses uh, took the oath. Uh, we will now begin with President Newsom. Good afternoon, Dr. Newsom, I think you need to turn your microphone on. Okay, I'll start again then. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and members of the Subcommittee on Science and Technology. I thank you for hosting this hearing to learn about how historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs as we call them, predominantly black institutions, PBIs, and other intended beneficiaries of the Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds are faring in accessing those dollars. I am delighted to be here as the president of Shaw University, a United Negro College Fund UNCF institution, and I'm delighted to be here as a member of the Board of Directors of the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education, NAFIO. Shaw is uh, the first, we claim, of the HBCUs to have been founded in the South. Two colleges, one school, and 10 departments employ 120 faculty members to serve approximately 2,800 students by providing a variety of academic offerings that are geared toward today's employment market. <clears throat> With the initial phases of the work of Congress completed on the Recovery Act, the legislation states that the goals of the Recovery Act include, and I quote, to provide investments needed to increase economic efficiency by spurring technological advances in science and health, unquote. The HBCU community, particularly through NAFIO, has at all times suggested that one critical measure of success in achieving this goal is the extent to which HBCUs and other under-resourced institutions are able to access recovery funds to make improvements to their infrastructures and enhance and expand research capabilities. With this in mind, I would like to share with you some of the challenges that Shaw University has experienced in seeking to access Recovery Act funds. And while I refer to specific instances at Shaw, I can assure you that other institutions around the nation, like Shaw, have had similar experiences in trying to access these funds. One of the largest challenges facing Shaw or any private institution in North Carolina is the lack of a mechanism for independent institutions to receive funds through the Recovery Act. 
The state of North Carolina thus far has limited funding to state institutions and state agencies, leaving Shaw University and many others unable to receive even the slightest assistance from these funds. Moreover, it is not clear at this point whether private and independent colleges will be able to participate in any meaningful way in the stimulus funding that has been made available to the state. In reaching out to federal institutions in order to seek assistance from Recovery Act funding, Shaw has continuously been met with uncertainty on the part of the agencies as to a process or procedure to direct these monies to private institutions. In addition, many agencies impose time constraints that make those funds all but inaccessible to such institutions. One instance of this is the requirement that funds be spent within too narrow of a time frame after receiving them or even after applying for them. For many private institutions of higher learning, it is nearly impossible to get the three estimates on each portion of the job as required by federal law, sign the contracts and schedule construction or other work before the time limit has expired. All of these challenges are made more difficult by the fact that many of the institutions seeking these funds are not planning to use them to begin a new program, but to take a heretofore isolated program and expand it to improve infrastructure and vastly improve academic programs by institutionalizing, inst institutionalizing them so they can be studied more extensively and more inclusively than the current arrangement allows. I want to share with you one example along that line, Mr. Chairman, at this point in order to stay within my time frame, We have a wonderful program going on in Bert County, uh, North Carolina, uh, with uh, uh, an experiment uh, producing biodiesel fuel by way of growing canola seed oil. I want to just flash a picture up here right quick and show you how we are doing. This is the canola plant that is mostly grown uh, in Canada. We are paying farmers in Bert County to grow this uh, plant. We're uh, using the oil to produce biodiesel fuel. We'll eat, we're even putting uh, fuel in the Bert County buses. There is the machine that we're using. There's a bus. We are able to expand this program. We will be able to expand this program significantly with the help of some of these Recovery Act funds if they are made, not only made available to the NSF, but made available to us by way of a process that allows those funds to reach us. I have some recommendations that I would like to share perhaps upon the uh, time that we come upon uh, the question and answer session, but at this point in time, I would say thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to come and share with you. Thank you, Dr. Newsom. I should say that um, part of the history of Shaw University is that Shaw University was where Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded uh, in 1960 by, among others, our colleague John Lewis, right. uh, shortly after the uh, Greensboro sit-ins that were led by students at, um, at A&T, North Carolina A&T. Uh, Dr. Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bilbray. Um, after hearing the, the uh, witnesses so far today, I think um, uh, from an OMB Watch perspective, I think it's safe to say that uh, the, a remarkable job has been done so far in the two and a half months since the law has been signed into uh, action. But it's not all we want, and I think that's what we're hearing today. Transparency is a high priority, but it is not the end game. Transparency is simply a tool to get us to the accountability that we've been talking about today. In that context, I want to summarize the testi written testimony by raising five challenges we have. The, the first challenge is who reports. If we don't get the <coughs> subrecipient reporting, if we don't get down to the lo lowest level or the, the smallest denominator, we will not achieve true accountability. Second question is uh, related to the testimony we just heard. How is the money to be obtained and allocated? We have grants.gov, we have fedbizops.gov, Fed, Fed we have state websites, but it is not clear how groups can actually apply and get that money. So the, and, and there's a great fear. This law was designed around both recovery and reinvestment, that one of the objectives is to ensure equity, and so we have to make sure that the money is reaching those areas where it was intended to go. The third question is, what's going to be reported? We've heard a fair amount about uh, uh, how data is going to come in. I want to talk about three kinds of data. 
a lot of emphasis has been put on the jobs data, which we need not only greater definition of jobs, as was mentioned by the previous panel, but I think we need related information, including what are the wages being paid, what kinds of benefits, what are the demographics of the people getting the job. Beyond the jobs comes performance data. I think all of us uh, uh, will be greatly interested in knowing precisely whether or not we are actually achieving the objectives of what the Recovery Act really, really is. This model, this new model that we're talking about on recovery presents a whole new opportunity, not just simply to find out who is getting how much money, but we can now start talking about is, it been, is the money been used properly? And we can talk about that in terms of performance. The third kind of data that we need is gonna be the request for proposals and the actual contracts that were used. Now, OMB has put out guidance saying they're gonna have summaries of contracts from the federal government, but as we all know, the bulk of the money right now is the formula money going out to the states. There is nothing that's gonna require clarity about ensuring uh, com competitive award systems or that uh, uh, those contracts are gonna be disclosed in any way for the public to see. So, who reports? How's the money allocated? What's being reported? The fourth one is, where is it gonna be reported? We need to have a centralized system where all of the subrecipients and recipients report. Um, not only do we need a centralized system, but we're gonna to have to have, make sure it's apples to apples in comparison. That means we're gonna to have to have the right kind of language for standardizing the content, as well as the mechanical, the machine readable format of this. We're gonna to have to have something that makes it accessible to everyone. That, there are many models for this. There is something extensible markup language is one example. There's a variant on XML called XBRL. We can go into all kinds of technical language. But the point is we need these standards if we are going to be able to compare from state to state or even within states or within program areas. And that leads me to the final challenge and the question and that is how will the public get access to any of this? And it seems to me it is more than just an issue of what kind of website recovery.gov is gonna be, or what colors, or what search, or what zip code you can put in. It seems to me that we have got to create the structure that has not only people access, but machine to machine readable access. If we do this right, if we do it right, the data that comes into the centralized reporting should be available not only to states, to Congress, to agencies, but to all of us on this panel and beyond this panel in terms of the public. We can do the value added as well as the government can do. So we have to create a new kind of democratic system with newer technologies to achieve meaningful public access. Let me just conclude by saying that the frame on Recovery Act right now is about waste, fraud, and abuse. And we need to have that frame. That is essential. There's a lot of money going out the door. The hope and the opportunity of all of this debate if we get this right, if we get it right now and we build the longer term beyond Recovery Act to talk about all federal spending down the road, is to create a new kind of dialogue, a new kind of opportunity for sharing information to improve the quality of programs that the government is funding. Instead of always the gotcha politics, we should be starting to talk about how we can make communities better and really do what the Act called for, which is reinvesting in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Dr. Ellig. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller, Mr. Bilbray. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Jerry Ellig. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And uh, the, the reason I responded so quickly to the invitation to testify here is because uh, for more than a decade, I've been involved with colleagues at the Mercatus Center in various projects to try to encourage the development, the adoption, and the use of performance measurement and performance information uh, by the federal government. Uh, our biggest project just today, in fact, we released the results of our 10th annual performance report scorecard, which, which examines the quality of the performance reports that federal agencies produce under the Government Performance and Results Act. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years. I can tell you we've seen a lot of improvement in the quality of reports. Uh, that are produced, a lot of improvement in the quality of the performance information that agencies are producing. We've seen some evidence in some other research that agencies that produce better re performance reports under GIPRA are also more likely to have more managers say they actually have and, and use performance information in their programs. Uh, our third goal, though, 
uh, was to try to encourage uh, folks in Congress to make use of performance information for oversight and for appropriations. And quite frankly, we've seen less evidence of that in past Congress Congresses. And for that reason, we're delighted that uh, this subcommittee is, is taking an interest in uh, Recovery Act accountability because we think this is a great opportunity to match up performance information with spending information. Uh, I'd like to make three points this afternoon. Uh, first off, the Obama administration in its guidance to agencies has said that agencies' Government Performance and Results Act measures and goals should be used to account for the results of Recovery Act spending. I think this is a great idea. And you're not going to get the word but followed by a contradictory statement from me on that either. I sincerely believe it's a great idea. Uh, if I had written the guidance, I would have said the same thing. Uh, I have a couple of suggestions that would, I think, make this even more effective. Um, one would be uh, to agencies in some way, either by OMB guidance or prodding from their oversight committees, uh, ought to be urged to report performance information along with the spending information so that the public, the media, other folks can juxtapose the two and find out you know, what they're getting in exchange for the spending. Uh, the other point that I think would uh, help improve the way this would work uh, is if agencies were explicitly required to do some rigorous program evaluation in order to control for other factors that affect outcomes so that we know how much of the reported outcome really was caused by the program spending and how much of the outcome really was caused by the additional spending that occurred as a result of the Recovery Act sort of basic application of the scientific method, great thing for a subcommittee of the Science and Technology Committee uh, to be looking into. Again, if the administration doesn't require agencies to do that, it would be great to have congressional oversight committees asking for the same type of information from agencies and making it public. Uh, second point, uh, although I think it's a great idea for agencies to use their GIPRA goals and measures to account for Recovery Act results, um, some of the goals and measures still need to be improved. I mentioned earlier that we released our 10th annual performance report scorecard this morning. Uh, we compared the results in that scorecard uh, with Recovery Act appropriations in Division A of the, the Recovery Act. We found that only about 14% of the appropriations are going to agencies that got very good scores on our performance report scorecard, and about a third of the appropriations are going to agencies that got below satisfactory scores. So this suggests that there's still a lot of room to improve the GIPRA measures and the GIPRA goals uh, before we have, we have the prom we've fulfilled the promise of full transparency and accountability for the Recovery Act spending. Uh, finally, just a word on measuring. Uh, the other thing that people are interested in out of the Recovery Act, in addition to the program outcomes, which is uh, creation of jobs and the employment effects. Uh, just want to emphasize that in order to understand the Recovery Act's effects on employment, uh, what we need is macroeconomic analysis that takes into account the effect of the spending as well as the effect of the borrowing. And that the numbers that are reported in a database as jobs created or preserved uh, by the Recovery Act are only giving us part of the picture, which is the number of people hired or that weren't fired because of the Recovery Act spending. We need to net that against the employment effects of the borrowing in order to figure out the actual effect of the Recovery Act on employment. So to figure that out, keep your eye on the macroeconomic analysis rather than the numbers reported in the database. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Alley. Ms. Ms. Bryan, was Pogo the cartoon character who said, we have met the enemy and he knows us? Absolutely. <laughs> that's not a mistake. Okay. Um, <laughs> that that's our acronym. Ms. Ms. Bryan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman and Mr. Bailbray, for inviting me to speak today. I am not only speaking on behalf of the Project on Government Oversight, but we're also, as an organization, a member of the Coalition for an Accountable Recovery, as is OMB Watch. And so I'm just describing to those recommendations that uh, Dr. Bass made in terms of the transparency for contracts. That's something terribly important to us as well. And I'm going to be limiting our, my testimony to focusing on improving resources for auditors, investigators, and whistleblowers. I view the level of protection against waste and fraud and abuse in the Recovery Act with mixed feelings. On the one hand, certain provisions provide a terrific opportunity to finally crack open the opaque world of government contracting so we could see this as a changed world for the future and not just limited to the Recovery Act. On the other hand, some of the essential protections are insufficient and others are simply non-existent. 
Due to those weaknesses, the velocity and magnitude of the Recovery Act spending makes me very anxious. One weakness that could be improved to STEM losses is the significant lack, as we heard um, Mr. Devaney speaking specifically to, of funding for state and local auditors and investigators. For every dollar IGs investigate, for example, in audits, there's an average return of more than $9, according to a recent GAO study. Uh, Chairman Towns has introduced recently legislation that we believe is an essential step in trying to help provide adequate re oversight of spending of these funds for those uh, underfunded state and local auditors. Whistleblowers will also be essential to minimizing losses. According to a study last year by the Association of F Certified Fraud Examiners, nearly half of the initial detection of occupational fraud, 46 percent, came from whistleblower, ti whistleblower tips rather than from internal auditors. It was an extraordinary study, I thought. For that reason, I am distressed to testify that one of the most significant weaknesses of the Recovery Act is in Section 1553, the section protecting whistleblowers. While it provides meaningful protections for state, local, and contractor whistleblowers, federal employees are yet again left out in the cold. This is simply absurd. Without solid protection, it is far less likely that a federal employee with knowledge of wrongdoing will come forward. The good news is there's now a lot of activity to report uh, to, to repair that damage, and I can report that yesterday there was, I was a member of a four-hour meeting at the White House discussing the need for uh, federal prote protections for federal whistleblowers, and uh, there's discussion in both the House and the Senate and having hearings soon. So maybe this fundamental deficiency in the Recovery Act could be resolved uh, soon with standalone legislation, and I certainly hope so. For those whistleblowers who are already protected by the Recovery Act, though, I want to focus on what needs to happen for the process to work effectively. First, potential whistleblowers need to know what their protections are and where to go with their disclosures. An individual in their hometown who comes across misconduct is unlikely to know to which website to turn. They may not even know which federal agency has awarded the original contract. In light of this, clear language should be on recovery.gov, on state and local websites, and on the websites of each of the inspector general, um, what whistleblower protections there are or are not and how to report waste, fraud, and abuse. IGs especially need to make a concerted effort to encourage people to come to them with their disclosures. Some IG offices are already doing a good job of this. However, POGO just released uh, in March our analysis of the IG, federal IG system and their accountability for, uh, for how they do their work. And uh, we found that many IGs are simply not effective at working with whistleblowers. In fact, I was just speaking with the Council of IGs about uh, two weeks ago, where a few IGs argued quite forcefully that they do not see it as appropriate for their offices to proactively reach out to whistleblowers. To make 1553 work effectively, it is imperative for IGs to make a concerted effort and sometimes change their culture to encourage people to come to them with their disclosures. Although the Council of IGs has recently announced a cross-cutting review of their hotline system, uh, the results from that review may come too late. And so I believe it's essential that interim steps be taken closer to uh, immediate than anything else to implement more effective systems than those that are in place now. The next problem is also on the IG side, handling the volume of intake responsibly. Currently, recovery.gov simply has a page that says, tell us your story. That's it. There are no explanations for a whistleblower about what kinds of information to report, how they are or are not protected, or how the information will be used. This is an, ad an invitation for problems. We know from our own experience you need to have very clear directions, a tracking system, and a way to communicate further with the whistleblower for this to work at all. Given the volume of intake they will be receiving, this is an enormous but essential task. Finally, when there is a successful case of a whistleblower disclosure identifying a problem, the IG needs to herald this as a case well done. But even if the systems were to work perfectly, serious and sustained oversight from both the board chaired by Mr. Devaney and the Congress are essential. The discretion, the discretion given IGs in the Recovery Act regarding when they will or will not investigate disclosures is so broad as to be very worrisome, and this is where oversight will play an essential role. Another area that requires congressional oversight and where this committee in particular has shown great strength is in overseeing the IGs themselves. For example, it is in large part because of this committee's terrific work that the NASA IG was finally forced to resign after his poor performance. And this committee deserves credit for sticking with that issue over the last few years. 
At the moment, the stars are not in complete alignment for taxpayers to benefit from whistleblower disclosures, audits, and investigations of misconduct in the Recovery Act spending. But the weaknesses are fixable. We just need to fix them now. And I look forward to working with the committee to accomplish that goal. Thank you. I did not get a Christmas card from Mr. Cobb this year. Um, Mr. Gillespie. Chairman Miller, uh, Mr. Bill Bray, and, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today with such a distinguished panel about oversight of the Recovery Act. Simply stated, our business provides a comprehensive view of government to businesses that want to do business with the government. We track all goods and services that are procured around the country across every industry, infrastructure, uh, architecture, engineering, water, energy, information technology. There are a variety of issues that create a transparency barrier which limits visibility into how funds are spent between the federal government and state, local, and education agencies around the country. The situation that everyone wants to avoid is one in which Recovery Act money will have been spent and untold amounts will have been lost, particularly at the state and local level, before anyone is fully aware of the loss. Mr. Devaney has previously testified that in his experience, a 7% number um, is a good metric to use for fraud in spending. That equates to $55 billion in the Recovery Act. Uh, which makes the stimulus fraud the 60th largest economy in the world, according to the IMF. It's effectively the size of the GDP of Ecuador. As a challenge, this market's highly fragmented. Uh, there are more than 89,000 state, local, and education agencies around the country, and an estimated 20,000 of those are going to receive some level of Recovery Act funding. In addition, at those agencies, there are hundreds of thousands of people procuring goods and services, and there are more than three million companies that are qualified to bid on Recovery Act projects. As you can see from these numbers, the sheer magnitude quickly creates an intractable problem when it comes to tracking, especially when you compress it into a very aggressive timeline. One more example to highlight that transparency barrier Several weeks ago, the administration held a press conference touting the 2000th transportation project that was undertaken as a result of the Recovery Act. That same day, we had actually tracked almost 5,000 transportation projects uh, that had been funded by the Recovery Act. So there's a significant delta in the data as it exists today. We set up our website, recovery.org, to primarily provide timely information to businesses in the marketplace, the businesses that create jobs with recovery funding. But an interesting user group has emerged at recovery.org. We're seeing the government come and use recovery.org. At the federal level, federal agencies are registering to get a comprehensive view of how the states are using the dollars, States are registering to see how counties and cities are using the dollars, and cities are registering to see how the other cities are using the, the dollars to make sure they're getting their fair share. It took us about two weeks to develop and launch the site, and it has a fairly simplistic interface which allows a user to select a state, a county, or a city and see the projects in that geographic area. Search engines, user interfaces, infrastructure, are all things that are key to a successful product like recovery.gov, but the primary reason why we were able to launch recovery.org in such a short period of time, in two weeks, was the underlying standardized taxonomy and the data that we have. Without the data that, that sits underneath it, none of the technology would have made it possible. Representatives from OMB have previously testified that recovery.gov receives hundreds of millions of hits even reaching 3,000 hits per second at one point, and by any measure, even those of online commercial enterprises, it's been wildly successful. The incredible volumes of traffic are, I think, emblematic of the intense public interest in engaging with their government via technology. And in my opinion, it's not unreasonable to think recovery.gov could have live searchable data in 30 to 45 days so that those hundreds of millions of visitors and hits 
don't go to waste, and they will if the data is not available soon. I've made a series of recommendations in my written testimony that I believe will help recovery.gov, and without getting into deep technical details, uh, Dr. Bass touched on this, suffice it to say that in order to maximize use and adoption, the data has to be available in formats that have low barriers to use. There are many excellent, free, non-proprietary formats and standards that can be leveraged, including the ones that, that Dr. Bass mentioned. With that, I'll conclude by saying that while this may presently feel like an impossible task, there's an enormous opportunity to use Recovery Act tracking to usher in a new era of transparency, accountability, and performance, and it'll set the stage for generations to come in terms of engaging in civic discourse with their government. Recovery.gov can be the flagship for government transparency and accountability. We fully support the goals that Congress and the administration have outlined and will continue to serve in any way we can to that end. Thank you for inviting me to testify here today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Gillespie. We'll now have uh, questions from the members present, uh, and I recognize myself for, uh, for five minutes. Um, uh, Mr. Bass, uh, Dr. Bass, Mr. Gillespie, you, you heard my questions to, I think it was Mr. Uh, Dodaro about uh, the Department of Energy uh, having obligated, contracted for $342 million in funds for the Office of Science. It's set out in some detail in the appendix, uh, but when you go to um, the website for the, DO, for the DOE, you can't find anything below the 342 number. Um, and I asked how they got that number, and apparently they just went in and looked at the raw written records and culled it by hand. Um, how is how difficult a task is it going to be? You've you've touched on this in your testimony uh, to get that level of detail, um, who the contractors are, how much they got, um, uh, in a way that can be on a website that. Uh, anybody can see and understand. Uh, I guess Dr. Bass first, then Mr. Gillespie. Mr. Chairman, first I'd want to clarify that there are, in essence, really two different reporting systems we're talking about. One is the reporting system from the federal agencies that is currently happening, and that's where the Department of Energy data is coming on weekly reports to recovery.gov. That's one reporting system. The second, which was mentioned in the last panel, starts the October, uh, what is it, 7th? Is that the 10th, October 10th? The first reporting from the recipients. And that will tell us how the money is actually being spent. And there are two very different systems. They have to come together. In terms of the first point one, which is the agency reporting, I think Mr. Gillespie's point is, is completely on target, that there already is data that can be made publicly available. It is not rocket science on how to make that data available. We have weekly reports, as you saw from uh, the, the screenshot you took that came out of Excel spreadsheets. Um, what recovery.gov should be today, today gathering is the detailed information that GAO got in a way, in a consistent manner from each of the agencies so that we, the public, can get not only access to it through recovery.gov in a searchable format, but access to the underlying data itself through various feeds so we can utilize it and do various kinds of manipulation. But having said that, I've got to be mindful that this is going to be an iterative process. We're going to make mistakes. Um, I think I, the first thing I thought of was OMB put out guidance to the agencies initially and told us to have a tag number that it said recovery. It had a number, which was great because we could start to identify the dollars. But they forgot to say put the name of the program. So we had all these account numbers and no name. And none of us knew what the heck the programs were with the account numbers. They're going to learn from mistakes like that. And I think we're going to have to, all of us, pitch in. And this is going to be a bipartisan. It's going to be a non-governmental. It's going to be a governmental effort to get this right. Mr. Gillespie. Uh, just to, to build off of what Dr. Bass said, the, the data issue is a significant issue. Not surprisingly, the Department of Energy uh, people at the Department of Energy have, have registered at our website um, to, to look at data and help track data. Um, it is a large problem and it gets larger as you get deeper into state and local. And it, it is a very different animal at the state and local procurement level than it is at the federal level. 
um, and, and gets many orders of magnitude greater as you get down lower. That's correct. Uh, um, Mr. Gillespie's uh, business has created, for a different reason, for a different motive, uh, a technology that does much of what we want to try to do for purposes of accountability and oversight. Um, Ms. Bryan, is it, how helpful to potential whistleblowers would it be to have that kind of access to information so they could connect dots uh, before blowing the whistle? Well, it's fantastic because essentially a whistleblower can be a person who walks down the street to see whether the bridge is being built. And if it's nothing's going on, <laughs> that they need to be able to figure that out. So information is the, is the central uh, uh, keystone to being a whistleblower. And, and so they need to have access to that information. Um, I will yield back my last 17 seconds. Mr. Bilbray. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as ranking member on the procurement uh, subcommittee of government oversight, I'm running back and forth between hearings, but it's appropriate. Um, in fact, um, this is Brian. One of the things that really has kind of shown up that one of the uh, uh, blatant problems we've run into in Afghanistan was not the for profit contracts, but for the non profit contracts and people claiming to have planted a, um, an orchard and then showing the picture of somebody else's orchard right. and giving the wrong GPS locations. Uh, but I want to get back to the, the ability to account on some of this thing. Uh, and I would open this up to any of the panelists who wants to talk about this, but one of the things that's going to be asked a lot about the success of this program is to, um, is to calculate how many jobs were created by this investment. How do we not only assess it, but document the creation of a job under this program? Um, I, th I think there are several steps. The first is that we have to have a better definition of what a job is, so we're all talking apples to apples here. Um, that's one step. I think the second is if we do have subrecipient reporting, Congressman, we will have the real opportunity to get information from the, the horse's mouth, if you will. This is an opportunity uh, in this model of Recovery Act to have the recipients who actually touch the dollars to report on literally what kind of jobs they have either saved or created. And instead of it being filtered one level up and up and up and up, we have a chance to have it reported directly so we all can see it. If it is done in the right manner, we can tie that data to the originating contract so we can see how that all fits with one another. This isn't, as I say, in, in some respects, this is a huge task, but we could break it up into smaller parts and think about the dollars that are, that are really being dealt with here. We heard from the first panel that the bulk of the dollars going out the door are really the health care dollars, the Medicaid dollars. So we could narrow the focus to some very specific areas like transportation and other areas to try and tackle this. Uh, how do we do this? So, you know, we had an instance here where the House tried to at least have a minimum standard of disclosure, and that was the E-Verify for everybody participating in the program. Our colleagues on the other side of the aisle not only did not accept it, they had it stripped. They did not want that level of investigation of just even checking that the social security number of anybody getting the programs or getting the job be identified. With that attitude coming out of, you know, the House of Lords on the other side, how do we assure the American people that we are going to have the database, we are going to ask the questions, we are going to go to the individual who's getting the job to make sure that they actually had a job, that they were working on. Um, how do we do that, especially under this environment that we started off with this thing where you actually had sort of a basic program that was 99.6% successful taken out of, of the, the review process from the get-go? Can we get that back in? Can we, you know, can we kind of go back and try to um, recapture that mistake? Well, oh, go ahead. 
Well, Congressman, my response is going to be just perhaps a little off from your question, so I'm going to pass on real quickly, but I want you to know in the HBCU world and colleges and universities like ours, we would feel ourselves privileged to be in a position to be measured and to be... If you could get it participate. If we could have access. Mm -hmm. There's another A that has to be added to this, uh, as, uh, assess accountability. The first one is access. Mm -hmm. We would count it an honor to be in a position to respond to a question like that because we were receiving funds and being asked to demonstrate that we were using those funds in the way intended. Yeah, and then let me just reinforce the fact a lot of people in this town don't realize that not just your institution, you have Catholic institutions that do huge outreach to disadvantaged, do huge outreach into the communities, and because they happen not to fall under the public guise, they've been fenced out of the system. Absolutely. But let's get back to this data issue. If I can't even find out, if I'm not even required to, uh, to check that a social security number and name matches, how can you require me to track this and document it down the line when, uh, can we add this in after the fact? It's a very difficult data problem, Congressman. Um, it has taken us 10 years to figure out how to do that. We do it every day, uh, but it, it is an intractable problem. There will be close to $100 billion spent by the October 10th date that Mr. Devaney spoke of on the, on the previous panel that will be out the door. And unless that level of transparency or that level of tracking is put in place soon, those funds will be gone and it will be a forensic audit that's required to understand it as opposed to being uh, prognostic or preventative. Yes, yeah, as, as with other kinds of performance information, you're going to have to have random audits and other types of procedures to make sure that it's actually, to verify that the information that's being reported is actually accurate. I, I think uh, an additional factor is the deterrent effect of congressional oversight. And I think having hearings like this uh, on a continuing basis so people would be afraid not to be reporting would be a helpful way to keep people honest and reporting as much as possible. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To be, you know, and not that um, uh, I'll be provocative, but the fact is I think there was a strong consensus on both sides of the aisle here that um, the E-Verify and starting off with who was being employed was an essential part of our credibility and it's too bad that there are powers that be and I have a feeling on both sides of the aisle on the over in the Senate that specifically did not want that kind of accountability and I think there's going to be a question asked again and again why in the world would you not want to check the minimum if you're going to promise to be to check everything else down the line, I think that's a real challenge that we have. And it didn't start in the House. It, you know, we ended up having to settle for a deal that came from the Senate. But I still question why were the people over there so hell bent not to have that accountability? Thank you. Could could I just chime in on Dr. Fayez? Yeah, last point. I I think, Congressman, I think given what we have today, I think we have to assess the situation um, as it is. And. What I think is important to understand is that OMB has the authority to request certain types of information, notwithstanding the specific statutory issue you were referring to, OMB could be collecting information around what kinds of jobs are being created, what are the wages being paid, what are the benefits that people are getting, where are, they, where are people who are getting employed, where are they coming from, these are the kinds of equity, equity questions that many of us want to have answered, and I think OMB can collect that. But if you do not know who it is who got the job, you can't audit it. That's the key. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying you can have the authority to get this far that I've just described. Uh, Dr. Newsom, I now recognize myself for another five minutes. Uh, Dr. Newsom, your testimony has hit upon a, one of the great frustrations for me in the uh, six years and four months that I've been in Congress and representing the district that I represent that includes both, for instance, Greensboro, County of Guilford, and Castle County, Yanceyville. Uh, the disparity in the personnel and the resources to apply for uh, funding programs to identify and apply for is enormous and it results in an inequity in, um, in the funds that actually uh, flow. Mm -hmm. um, you've identified it as a problem for HPCUs, yes. uh, specifically in getting research funding, uh, that Shaw is at a competitive disadvantage in that way from 
uh, compared to, say, uh, Duke. Um, how can we get at that? How can we provide more, uh, a more equitable uh, way of providing grant funding and one that does not give such a, an advantage to larger units mm -hmm. that have the personnel and the resources to identify and apply for uh, funding? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're quite right uh, in suggesting that uh, other minority institutions share the same kind of challenge as Shaw University, and that basically is a kind of economy of scale issue. I would suggest that one way to begin is by having representatives from these institutions um, participate in some very strategic conversations um, and discussions with uh, state personnel in particular, because this is where we're having our log jams, our confusion, our bottlenecks and the like, and together work out some uh, ways and means to uh, free these funds up to uh, flow to these institutions. Um, at the state level, um, access is made possible primarily by way of um, a website, and um, uh, the website is constantly being bought, bombarded with all kinds of um, uh, requests. In other words, it's overused. It's hard to get through. It's hard to get responses. We need to come together and have the people who are to benefit from these funds uh, work hand in hand with those who are charged and who have a mandate to make those funds available to come up with a uh, very satisfactory uh, resolution and solution. Develop the policies, develop the procedures, and then hold each other mutually accountable. Because accountability comes to light at that point as well. The states are charged to make funds available. We want to make sure those funds get where they should go. The recipients ought to participate in the development of process, processes, procedures, and policies to ensure that that happens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gillespie, I'm sorry, I'm Mayor. calling upon you as you're reading a note. Um, maybe your note includes the, the answer to the question. Um, the, uh, I said earlier that your your website you developed your website for reasons that were not the same as the reasons that we're trying to develop recovery.gov as an instrument of accountability and transparency as a management tool for government um, but to help people who want to contract with the with the federal government but its effect is the same uh, is is similar um, and you have already run the traps many of the traps that the uh, that recovery.gov presumably will have to run uh, has anyone from Mr. Devaney's staff talked to you about uh, how your website works, what problems you've encountered, uh, how you've over overcome the obstacles, et cetera? I received the first contact from Mr. Devaney's office this week and expect to meet with them at the end of this week. Okay. I yield back my balance of the time, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Mr. Bilbray has no further questions either. Not for ratings or um, Well, as uh, Ms. Bryan and others have suggested, this needs to be something that we continue. Uh, and we, or, when I've heard the phrase, uh, bless his heart, it, it, he means well. It usually is not a compliment. Um, <laughs> but the first step in providing accountability, as I said before, uh, and transparency is that you need to want to provide account, account, uh, accountability and transparency. Uh, and we have now embarked upon that. And we may have obstacles. We may not uh, successfully deliver as much accountability as we had hoped. Uh, but this will not be the last time we spend f government funds. Uh, the obstacles that we encounter uh, and overcome will be overcome for the future. Uh, so this is a continuing effort, uh, both with respect to specifically the stimulus funding, the um, the 500 billion or so that we are spending, and, and actually, Mr. Gillespie, I think probably the correct figure is more like 35 billion. There's only 35 billion in waste. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, how much uh, comfort we should take in that uh, number being a little lower, because almost 40 percent of the recovery funds were actually tax cuts. Right. Um, uh, but this is, is something we, we need to continue. We will continue to hold hearings, and um, we hope we will not have to have hearings where we call miscreants um, to account, um, where our, um, our beginning uh, 
admonishments that uh, witnesses are entitled to, uh, to counsel uh, and are under oath um, uh, will, will actually uh, be pertinent to the testimony we will get. Mr. Chairman, may I just offer one additional word? Dr. Newsom. I serve, thank you, I serve on the North Carolina State Ethics Commission. And I certainly am a proponent and a champion for accountability, fair play. But in the final analysis, the end game is results. Results. And this is what this uh, initiative is all about. The HBCU community has a short-term economic impact of $10 billion. Our contribution to the job market is around 180,000 plus, making us maybe the 23rd largest employer collectively in the nation. Our campuses are full of creative and innovative energy. We take a little of nothing and turn it into something miraculous. Who would have thought that an institution Shaw University size would be helping to stimulate the economy in one of the poorest counties in the entire country, not just North Carolina, through an NSF grant paying farmers to grow a crop that grows during the winter so that we add to their growth cycle, reducing their overhead by taking that crop, providing them fuel, reducing the overhead of the school system so that they can uh, stretch their meager dollars to improve their, uh, 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 their uh, performance. If we had the funds to augment what we do the results would be tremendous, redounding not just to um, the benefit of the HBCUs and the contribution that they make within that world, but to the health and well-being, fiscally and otherwise, socially, of the republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, for the record, we grow our crops in the winter all the time in California, but that's a different issue. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know you had a winner. Um, <laughs> this happened to be the largest ag state in the union. <laughs> all right, before we bring this hearing to a close, I do want to thank all the witnesses for testifying. Uh, and uh, under the Rules of the Committee, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members, uh, as well as for any answers to any follow-up questions uh, the committee may have, may have for the witnesses. Uh, the witnesses are now excused and the hearing is adjourned.